Ben Carson at Emory University. And uh, this is actually a photo from the official uh, uh, ceremony where they're giving him his honorary doctorate. Uh, ben Carson was invited to give the commencement address at Emory University for this year. A little bit about Emory, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, it was founded in honor of a bishop of the Methodist Church called John Emory by, of course, Methodists in 1836. It got moved to the Atlanta area uh, largely due to a donation by the Coca-Cola Company and in 1915, and it's been there ever since, although it, it still maintains a campus at the original location. It was uh, rated at one point, at least in the top 20 of universities, according to U.S. News and World Report. And uh, what uh, I'm going to introduce next uh, came as a reaction to the um, Invitation of Ben Carson, and it's found in the uh, rather interestingly named uh, Emory Wheel, which is their kind of school paper. Um, and that was the website address, and here's the screenshot from the, uh, from the paper, which is, of course, available on the Internet. It's a letter to the editor about Ben Carson's outright rejection of evolution which is against Emory's ideals. And uh, the editorial has been updated for a little bit since uh, uh, apparently it was originally thought to be the work of one person, but there's actually four people who claim credit for it and about 500 others who have signed on to it. To the editor, we are writing to call the attention of, Emory, of the Emory community to this year's commencement speaker's denial of evolution. Maybe sort of like climate change denial or something. Dr. Ben Carson is a world-renowned neurosurgeon who has advanced medicine and who has supported the education of countless children throughout his, through his philanthropic organization. These accomplishments can provide a great inspiration to graduating Emory students. But as those students, their families, and the Emory community listen to his speech, we ask you also to consider the enormous positive impact of science on our lives and how that science rests squarely on the shoulders of evolution. What is most deeply concerning about Dr. Carson's dismissal of evolution is that he equates the acceptance of evolution with a lack of ethics and morality. In an interview published on the Adventist Review website, he states, quote, ultimately, if you accept the evolutionary theory, you dismiss ethics. You don't have to abide by a set of moral codes. You determine your own conscience based on your own desires. Dr. Carson insists not on seeing a difference between science which is predictive, on not seeing a difference. Science which is predictive and falsifiable and religious belief systems which by their very nature cannot be falsified. This is especially troubling since his great achievements in medicine allow him to be viewed as someone who, quote, understands science, end quote. Accepting evolution in the scientific method in general are not at odds with being moral or religious as is well demonstrated by strongly religious scientists and political and academic leaders, including Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health, I'm sure he's pleased to know that he has been officially endorsed, even though uh, he has trouble with the uh, evolutionists. <laughs> um, although, to be fair, it's not the evolutionists uh, so much as the uh, atheists. Uh, President Jimmy Carter and many of the faculty and students who will be attending commencement on May 14th. Dr. Carson argues that there is no evolution, evidence for evolution, that there are no transitional fossils that provide evidence for the evolution of humans from a common ancestor with other apes, that evolution is a wholly random process, and that life is too complex to have originated by the natural process of evolution. All of, those claim, all of these claims are incorrect. The evidence 
or evolution is overwhelming. Ape human transition fo uh, transitional fossils are discovered at an ever increasing rate, and the process by which organisms evolve new and more co complex body plans are now known to be caused by relatively simple alterations of the expressions of small numbers of developmental genes. Uh, our understanding of the evolutionary process has advanced our ability to develop, develop animal models for disease, our ability to combat the spread of infectious disease, and in point of fact, the work of Dr. Carson himself is based on scientific advances fostered by an understanding of evolution. Finally, much of the research at this university is based on advances fostered by an understanding of evolution. The theory of evolution is as strongly supported as the theory of gravity and the theory that infectious diseases are caused by microorganisms. Dismissing evolution disregards the importance of science and critical th thinking to society, stating that those who accept the underlying principle of biology and medicine are unethical, not only encourages the insertion of unnecessary and destructive wedges between Americans, but stands against many of the ideals of this university. Uh, that last sentence is kind of interesting. And uh, there are the four signatories, and of course the full list of the signatories can be found online. Um, the uh, um, the protest uh, makes reference to a cover story that some of you may have read in the Adventist Review, Conversation with Dr. Ben Carson by Jonathan Gallagher. And uh, I brought up the notes so you can see it, the Director of, Pedi <coughs> Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. And of course, world famous in terms of operating on uh, congenitally joined Siamese twins. Sitting in his study with Baltimore neurosurgeon Ben Carson, which is, that's the reference that I just read, I engage him in conversation and the discussion terms to the subject of evolution and origins. Now, so this is not the complete um, uh, interview. As we face each other between the erudite tomes and the bookcase and the modern technological equipment on the desk, it feels appropriate to think about who we are and where we came from. Carson, like this computer, if you came into this room and saw the, the computer, you wouldn't think it just happened. It didn't have come about by random events. And Jonathan Gallagher says, so why do so many people prefer to believe in the random formation of the universe and of life itself? Or to put it another way, why is the matter of evolution so important? It comes down to a matter of ownership. Who owns the universe? Who owns the earth? Who owns your life? Those who believe in evolution and in a naturalistic explanation of the universe ultimately see themselves as end owners, as the creator and ultimate source of authority. In this way, they answer to nothing and nobody, for there is nothing higher than themselves. How does this happen? What are the consequences of accepting evolutionary views of human origins? How does this affect society and the way we see ourselves? And Carson's answer, by believing we are the product of random acts, we eliminate morality and the basis of ethical behavior. For if there is no such thing as moral authority, you can do anything you want. You make everything relative, and there's no reason for any of our higher values. Gallagher, if we are all the product of chance, the random assortment of atoms living in a deterministic universe that is simply the consequence of physical interactions, doesn't it all seem so futile? Carson, yes, in my education I had to learn evolutionary theories, and as a God-fearing Christian I wondered how to make God and evolution mesh. The truth is that you can't make them mesh, you have to choose one or the other. Gallagher, too many Christians have given up too much science, conceding not just the observed data, but the anti-God interpretations. Are you often questions about being both a logical scientist and a Christian? And Carson's answer, yes, my answer is that the more you understand science, the less you can believe that all this is an accident. Just look at the brain. With its billions and billions of neurons, 
and hundred billions of connections and how it remembers everything it has ever seen and heard. And Jonathan Gallagher interjects everything. This does not seem to be a correct portrayal of my brain at least. I'm forgetting things all the time. And Carson says, put a probe on the hippocampus of an 80-year-old man and he can tell you verbatim the words of a book he read 60 years ago. This is a highly complex and sophisticated organ, not a likely result of chance processes. Not even by slow degrees, even if you allow the formation of a single cell, and a single-celled organism is also amazingly complex, the cell membranes, the nucleotides, the mitochondria, plus we give evolutionists too much if we start with a single cell, try starting with inert substances. But supposing you did have that first cell. Even if you accept evolutionary theory, developing a more sophisticated organism in this theoretical log theoretically logical fashion, then there should be a continuum of organisms. And why did evolution divert in so many different, so many directions, birds, fish, elephants, apes, humans, if there is some force evolving to the maximum, why isn't everything a human, a superior human? Darwin specifically stated that his theory hung on the discovery of intermediate forms and was sure that we would find them. More than a hundred years later, we still haven't found them. Even the earliest fossils don't show such intermediates. Take this simple case of ape to human. It should be easy to find abundant fossil remains since according to evolutionary theory, this is the most recent transition. If we can find so many fossils of dinosaurs which are further back in the evolutionary scheme, we should have plenty of evidence of intermediates between apes and humans, but we don't have them. We have a very few supposed intermediates like Lucy based on fanciful reconstructions with a lot of filling in. Today, we have people with significant congenital abnormalities whose skeletal remains would seem like a missing link. So Lucy does not make the case, and there should be multiple Lucys if the transition from ape to human were true. Also, there's the whole subject of irreducibly complex organisms. The idea that everything has to be there all at once for it to work. How could all the complex items evolve simultaneously, as in the eye, for example? Would so many scientists who disagree with your views be a concern to you? After all, 99% may say you're wrong. Carson, before Darwin, most scientists were Christian. Even Darwin was brought up as a Christian, but he became embittered. He set out to prove another explanation for, to life. I have to give the man credit. He was a powerful observer. On the Galapagos Islands, he found thick-billed finches whose bills were capable of breaking apart hard seeds. He also discovered iguanas and tortoises with different adaptations. Therefore, he concluded that these organisms were evolving and that he was right in terms of microevolution, adaptations to the environment. Imagine if you only got fed if you could dunk a basketball. Now, I was really wondering where he was going with this one. Evolving basketball players? But then he made a telling point. Only tall people would be fed and would survive. They would pass on their tall genes to their offspring. Is this evolution or adaptation? Obviously it's the latter, but evolution means one organism eventually changing into another quite different. And there's no evidence for such change. God allowed for adaptation, which speaks of a wonderful creator who gave his creatures a genetic structure flexible enough to adapt. But that's not evolution. Then we turn the conversation head, heavenward. Look at the complexity of the universe, too. The Hubble's telescope has revealed much more to us. But our galaxy is just a tiny dot in the great scheme of the universe. And there's much more beyond what we know. Even in our own solar system, we orbit 93 million miles from the sun. If it were 92 million miles, we'd be incinerated. 94 million miles, and we'd be a frozen ice ball. There's so much. It, uh, it's also extraordinarily organized with such complexity. How does that happen? Then take the ideas 
of the origin of the universe. The scientists speak about the second law of thermodynamics, which states that everything tends towards a state of disorganization. And Jonathan Gallagher injects, uh, maybe you've seen my desk, a stray thought occurs to me as it streaks across my brain. Uh, get back to Carson. So how could our incredibly organized universe come about as a result of a Big Bang? This flies in the face of the second law, which says it would be less organized as a result, not more. Scientists have to be consistent. A few closing thoughts. Ultimately, if you accept the evolutionary theory, you dismiss ethics. You don't have to abide by a set of moral codes. You determine your own conscience based on your own desires. You have no reason for things such as selfless love when a father dives in to save his son from drowning. You can trash the Bible as irrelevant, just silly fables, since you believe that it does not conform to scientific thought. You can be like Lucifer, who said, I will make myself like the Most High. Can you prove evolution? No. Can you prove creation? No. Can you use the intellect God has given you to decide whether something is logical or illogical? Yes, absolutely. It all comes down to faith. And I don't have enough to believe in evolution. I'm too logical. So that's the uh, article that got out there. Yes. Uh, this is Adventist Review. And I'm sorry I can't tell you how many years ago I did see it uh, on its way through. Let me just, uh, it doesn't have a uh, timeline on it. Anyway, there's the web address if you need it, and it'll be available in the video, I suppose. Um, the president of the university, interestingly, after this little brouhaha, promised to vet speakers better in the future, according to an email by Jacobus de Rude, re reproduced in the comments to the Emory Wheel. And uh, there's the link to the comment itself. Um, here's what has happened since the letter was published. On, uh, this is an email that's been reproduced in the comments here. Dear all, I wish to use this email to thank all of you who signed the letter uh, that Nicole Gerardo Ilya and I wrote with uh, regard to Benjamin Carson's denial of evolution. The response to this letter was overwhelming with 496 people signing the letter in the 24 hours following our, our initial email. The published letter as well as a full set of signatures can be found at the Emory Wheel and there's the um, on Thursday, 26 April, President Jim Wagner met with the Faculty Science Council, and one of the items on the agenda was the Emory Whale letter. We had an enormously positive and fruitful discussion. <coughs> this is from the lead author of the person who uh, put the, uh, uh, the person, the, the people who put the uh, letter up who has been made aware of the letter early in the week, had been. Starting off, with this, uh, starting off this discussion was the mutual agreement that Dr. Carson is a fantastic physician who is likely to inspire many young people in realizing their dreams to become medical doctors. President Wagner explained that the community who had invited Dr. Carson and recommended him for an honorary degree inhumane letters, not science, had not fully explored Dr. Carson's view on evolution. He explained that the university has already implemented an additional background checking step in the procedures that will lead to commencement speaker invitations and the awarding of honorary degrees in the future. Overall, President Wagner thanked all of us who had signed the letter for bringing up this important issue and for starting a valuable discussion among the Emory community. He expresses his hopes that this discussion can be followed up in the fall with a college-wide discussion on truth and systems of belief. It turns out, at least according to what the protesters were putting out, that they claim not to want to disinvite Ben Carson. And again, 
there's the reference and and this is a part of the uh, of the article world renowned Johns Hopkins neurosurgeon ben, Dr. Ben Carson is under fire from several biology professors at Emory University where he's scheduled to give the commencement address they wrote a letter to the school newspaper after learning Carson does not believe in evolution calling it deeply concerning that he equates the acceptance of evolution with a lack of ethics and morality and that not only encourages the insertion of unnecessary and destructive wedges between Americans, uh, but stands against many of the ideals of the university. Dr. Carson was a childhood hero of mine, and he is still a hero of mine, said Ari Eisen, PhD, Emory University Department of Biology. What worried me the most was the fact that he said, if you do accept evolution, then you're somehow ethically lacking. The professors say this is no protest, and they still want Carson to speak at the commencement. They say they simply want to draw attention to Carson's stance. And then Eisen says again, I credit my university with being open to and engaging in these conversations because it's not having those conversations where that may lead to many dangerous situations in politics and beyond that we see in our country today. <coughs> So, now, of interest, uh, Richard Weikert uh, defended Carson's position on evolutionary morality. And there's uh, his article in the Baltimore uh, Sun as well, which uh, has been reproduced in World uh, Magazine or something like that, Christian uh, Magazine. And... Uh, this is kind of interesting. The biology professors at Emory and their supporters also accuse Dr. Carson of committing a thought crime because he allegedly equates acceptance of evolution with a lack of ethics and morality. And Richard Wyken says, uh, since I'm a historian who studied and published on the history of eth evolutionary ethics, I was rather surprised by the Emory fac faculty's consternation over Dr. Carson's belief that evolution undermines objective evident ethics and morality. Last summer, I attended a major interdisciplinary conference at Oxford University on, quote, the evolution of morality and the morality of evolution. Thus, I am well aware that there are a variety of viewpoints in academia on, the top, on this topic. Nevertheless, many evolutionists from Darwin to the present, including quite a few at the Oxford conference, have argued and are still arguing precisely the point that Dr. Carson was highlighting. They claim that morality has evolved and thus has no objective existence. One of the keynote speakers at the Oxford conference was the leading philosopher of science Michael Ruse, who stated in a 1985 article co-authored with Harvard biologist E. O. Wilson, both of whom are I think well known in the evolution creation controversy, ethics as we understand it is an illusion fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. Why do biologists at Emory try to make Dr. Carson appear foolish for asserting that evolution undermines ethics while one of the leading evolutionary biologists and one of the leading philosophers of science admit that evolution destroys any objective morality? Professor Wilson in his book, Consilience, argued, either ethical principles such as justice and human rights are independent of human experience or else they are human inventions. He rejected the former explanation, which he called transcendentalist ethics, in favor of the latter, which he named empiricist ethics. And uh, he talks about the field of sociobiology. And, um, then uh, goes on to say the idea that uh, evolution undermines objective moral stance is hardly a recent discovery of sociobiology, however. In The Descent of Man, Charles Darwin devoted many pages to discussing the evolutionary origin of morality, and he recognized what this meant. Morality is not objective, is not universal, and can change over time. Darwin certainly believed that ethics, evolution had ethical implications. And uh, uh, he says Ben Carson then should hardly be pilloried for arguing that evolution has ethical implications, that it undermines morality. 
If Emory University professors want to argue that ethic, evolution has no ethical implications, they are free to make their argument. I wonder how many of them actually believe this. However, if they do, they need to recognize that they are not arguing just against benighted anti-evolutionists, but they are arguing against many of their cherished colleagues in ev evolutionary biology, including Darwin himself. So that's uh, Richard Weicker's profession, uh, professor of history at Cal State University, Stanislaus, and author of From Darwin to Hitler. Anyway, uh, there's a comment on, on Richard Dawkins' blog, which uh, probably is worth uh, looking at. Um, and uh, that was the reference, and he says, I'm a PhD ca candidate in neuroscience at Emory University. Here at Emory, we have been dealing with a wave of controversy regarding the university selection for a commencement speaker. Uh, Dr. Ben Carson is an ex uh, accomplished neurosurgeon and humanitarian, but he's also a creationist, an evolution denier, who had made some pretty ignorant statements about those of us that understand evolution is true and are that do not believe in God. So apparently he's in both categories. He said, ultimately, if you accept evolutionary theory, you dismiss ethics, you don't have to abide by a set of moral codes. Adding that if you accept evolutionary theory, quote, you have no reason for things such as selfless love. Now that one, I don't think I saw in the Adventist Review, but maybe he found that elsewhere. Naturally, this didn't sit right with a lot of us here in Emory Department of Biology. A group of faculty penned a letter to the editor of the campus news uh, paper, and the letter was signed by about 500 students, faculty, and alumni the, over the course of only a couple of days. And uh, then he copies the letter verbatim. So that's what got onto Richard Dawkins' blog. Uh, just uh, richarddawkins.net. Anyway, uh, I imagine that by now you're kind of curious as to what in the world Ben Carson would say. So I'm going to try to see if I can uh, make this work because we've this is kind of an experiment if I can do that. There we go. This program is brought to you by Emory University. This is deliberately silent, I think, on the original. And Dean Thomas Lawley, will you present our fifth honored guest? On YouTube. Mr. President. Mr. Dean. I have the honor to present to you Dr. Benjamin Carson to receive the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. I don't notice any booze. Benjamin S. Carson, Sr., courageous physician, exemplary humanitarian, tracing intellectual and spiritual ascent out of the bonds of a risk-filled childhood, your story lifts the hearts and steals the courage of countless men and women. You combine learning, fortitude, and nimble hands to heal and save fragile lives. You have used your renown and influence to forge new hopeful paths for young people. Your generous spirit and rigorous intellect demonstrate the world-transforming, life-engendering power of a wise heart harnessed to a keen and searching mind. In gratitude for the best qualities of humanity that shine brilliantly through your life and work, we bestow on you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. And at this time, I would like to ask Dr. Carson to deliver our keynote address. Dr. Carson. A 
thank you very much. It is indeed a great honor to be here at uh, Emory, Emory University, and congratulations to the graduates and to their families on this great milestone. You know, I have a, a lot of connections uh, with Emory and know a lot of people who've come from Emory to Hopkins and vice versa. Uh, Dr. Mike Johns uh, was the one who got me started doing complex craniofacial surgery. Uh, Dr. The late Dr. Frey Marshall, when he was an assistant professor and I was an intern, uh, guided me through some of my very first operations. We have uh, wonderful students uh, who've come from Baltimore, like uh, Allison Daniels, who's graduating here today, and just a host of uh, amazing people uh, that we know who are here at, at Emory. Now, let me just, uh, at the outside, outset say that uh, I know there was some controversy uh, about uh, my views on uh, creation and uh, somebody thought that I said that evolutionists are not ethical people. Of course I would never say such a thing and would never believe such a thing nor would anybody with any common sense. So you know that's, uh, that's pretty ridiculous. But uh, at any rate enough said about that. You know I as a youngster was incredibly interested in medicine. It was really the only thing that, that kind of grabbed my fancy. And uh, if there was anything on television or radio about uh, medicine, I was right there like a magnet. I even like going to the doctor's office. So, you know, that gives you some idea of what I was like. Going to the hospital was my favorite thing in the world. You know, most people, they go to the hospital and they have to wait for a few hours. They get all huffy and they say, you know, my time is important too. But not me, you know, I would sit out there in the hallway and uh, we would have to wait for one of the interns or residents to see us because we were on medical assistance, but I didn't care because I was listening to the PA system. Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones to the emergency room, Dr. Johnson to the clinic. They sounded so important. And uh, I would be sitting there thinking one day they'll be saying, Dr. Carson, Dr. Carson. But of course, nowadays we have beepers, so I still don't get to hear it. But, uh, <laughs> but it, was, it was the dream, you know, and it's sometimes that dream is really the only thing that pushes you through the very, very difficult times. But sometimes dreams can be bad. And uh, some of you may remember some summers ago the case of the Bajani twins, the 29-year-old Iranian women who were joined at the head, their lifelong dream was to be separated. They scoured the world looking for a team that might be willing to take on that enormous risk. You know, when I was first contacted by them, I, I told them about Chang and Ying Bunker, the original Siamese twins, who lived to be 63 years old and never got separated. They didn't want to hear that. So they finally ended up with a team in Singapore that had had some success separating craniopagus twins before. It was a team that I was familiar with and had worked with before and somehow they managed to convince me to join them against my better judgment. But I must say, when I met those young ladies, I was duly impressed. They were vivacious. They had learned to speak English in only seven months. Incredibly intelligent. They both had college degrees. They both had law degrees. Only one wanted one, but they both had law degrees. <laughs> so, you know, they had a very thorough understanding of the risk that they were facing. And you know, they said something to me that really struck me. They said, Doctor, we would rather die than spend another day stuck together. And that seemed kind of harsh. But then I did something that I highly recommend to everyone before you criticize someone. I, I put myself in their shoes. And I said, what would it be like to be stuck to somebody 24-7? It could be the person in the world you like the most. How long would you like them for? And I began to understand what it was that they were going through. Well, you know, that operation did go on. We were in the third day of the operation. We were 90% finished. Some people were starting to celebrate. I was not among them. Because as we got to the very end of that operation, they began to bleed profusely under great pressure. It was impossible to stop the hemorrhaging, and they died. And you know, not everything that we do, obviously, is successful. And that really is kind of the history of surgery. You know, the first kidney transplants, disastrous. Heart transplants, lung transplants, liver transplants, disastrous. You'd say, why even bother? But things were learned, and that accumulated knowledge. 
made it possible to be able to do those things, so vitally important. Thomas Edison said he knew 999 ways a light bulb did not work. You know, most of you have heard the cleaning formula 409. Why do they call it that? The first 408 didn't work. You know, you think about Walter Dandy, the incredible neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins many decades ago. The first one to do all kinds of things. First one to operate on the posterior fossa. People said, you can't operate back there. The compartment is too small. The brain will swell. They will die. But he operated on somebody with a lesion of the posterior fossa, and they died. And another, and they died. Another, they died. The first 13, they all died. Can you imagine how discouraged he must have been? I can't even imagine what he said to the 14th patient. You know, when they said, how'd the other 13 do? He probably said, nobody's complaining. But, you know, the fact <laughs> of the matter is, he just, he kept it up. And now we're able to do posterior fossa operations quite safely and quite routinely. And it's a matter of being able to learn from things that don't work because we all get involved in them and we should not become discouraged but take something away from it and it will not be a true failure. We can also learn from other people's mistakes. And this is so vitally important because you are going out there to become the next generation of leaders in our nation. And there's a great deal that we can learn from other societies that have divided themselves. A wise man once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And we find ourselves in a situation where we have such divisiveness. You know, Democrats have some good ideals. Democrats have some bad ideals. Republicans have some good ideals. Republicans have some bad ideals. That's why I'm an independent. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we have got to understand something. The symbol of our nation, bald eagle. And when you see an eagle flying, what do you notice about it? It has two wings, a left wing and a right wing. If it's both left wings, it crashes. If it's both right wings, it crashes. But when they work together, it is able to fly high and straight. And there is something that we need to learn about that, which will be incredibly important to us. I think the other thing that threatens the prosperity and the vitality of our nation is political correctness. You know, many people came to this nation and they were trying to escape from societies to try to tell them what they could say and what they could think. And here we come reintroducing it through the back door. And we need to remember that it is not important that we all think the same thing. And the emphasis should not be on us all saying that thing, saying thing. The emphasis should be on us learning how to be respectful of individuals who have a different opinion. And that's one of the things that made America great, the ability to engage in dialogue. And I've always said, if two people think the same thing about everything, one of them isn't necessary. And we need to be able to, to understand that if we're going to make real progress. There was a time in the history of the world when there was great intolerance for anybody who thought differently in the mainstream. It was called the Dark Ages. And there's some things that can be learned even in places and in societies where we think we know everything. Because if you look over the course of time, you will find a migration of what is thought to be the truth. And if we all engage in appropriate intellectual discussion, I think we will get there much faster. I think the other thing that is so important for our success is persistence. Understanding who we are, what our values are. You know, I remember as when I started high school, I was a straight A student. I hadn't always been a straight A student. When I was in grade school, I was a terrible student. In fact, my nickname was Dummy. That's what everybody called me. And um, 
you know, fortunately I had a mother who believed in me when nobody else did. And she was always saying, Benjamin, you're much too bright to be bringing home grades like this. I brought them home anyway, but she was always saying that and she was always being very, very encouraging. And uh, she came home one day and she turned off the TV. And she said, you guys can only watch two or three TV programs during the week. And with all your spare time, you had to read two books of peace from the Detroit Public Libraries and submit to me written book reports, which she couldn't read, but we didn't know that. You know, she would put little check marks and highlights and underlines, but you know, I really despised it. I didn't want to do it. But uh, everybody else was outside playing and having a good time there. I was in the house reading books. And an interesting thing happened, though. I actually began to enjoy reading those books. We were desperately poor, but between the covers of those books, I could go any place, I could be anybody, I could do anything. I began to know things that nobody else knew. Within the space of a year and a half, I went from the bottom of the class to the top of the class, much to the consternation of all those people who used to laugh and call me dummy. The same ones who called me dummy in the fifth grade were coming to me in the seventh grade, Benny, Benny, how do you work this problem? And I'd say, sit at my feet, youngster, while I instruct you. I was, uh, I was, I was perhaps a little obnoxious, <laughs> but it sure felt good to say that to those turkeys. But, you know, but, but that's one of the reasons that, that my wife and I have devoted so much time to encouraging young people because we recognize that there's an enormous amount of untapped intellectual potential out there and that we have to do everything we can to cultivate it because for every one of those young people around this nation who we can keep from going down that path of self-destruction, that's one less person we have to protect ourselves and our families from. One less person we have to pay for in the penal or the welfare system one more tax-paying, productive member of society who may discover a new energy source or the cure for cancer. We cannot afford to throw any of them away. They're all important parts of our society. But as I entered high school, with all of this intellectual potential, I ran into perhaps the worst thing a young person can run into. It's called peers. Negative peers, P-E-E-R-S. That stands for people who encourage errors, rudeness, and stupidity. And that's exactly what they were doing. And I got caught up in that. And uh, my grades began to plummet. And uh, fortunately, I only wasted one year before I came to my senses and began to recognize, again, those values and those principles that were going to drive me towards success. But there were other problems. You know, when I got to medical school, I was trying to fit myself into someone else's mold. And uh, on the first set of comprehensive exams, I did terribly. And I was sent to see my counselor. And he looked at my record and he said, you seem like a very intelligent young man. I bet there are a lot of things you could do outside of medicine. He tried to convince me to drop out of medical school, said, you're not cut out to be a doctor. And uh, it'll be so much easier for you and for everybody else if you drop out. We can actually help you get into another area of the university so you will not have wasted a year. Well, you can imagine, I was devastated. And I went back to my apartment and I just said, Lord, give me wisdom. And I started thinking. And uh, I said, what kind of courses have you always done well in? What kind of courses have you struggled in? And I realized I did well in courses where I did a lot of reading, and I struggled courses where I listened to a lot of boring lectures. And there I was listening to six to eight hours worth of boring lectures every day. So I made an executive decision to skip the boring lectures and to spend that time reading. And the rest of medical school was a snap after that. And uh, some years later, when I went back to my medical school as the commencement speaker, I was looking for that counselor because I was going to tell him he wasn't cut out to be a counselor. <laughs> because, you know, there's so many people who are just negative, 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 and they can always think of a reason why something can't be done, but they don't spend very much time figuring out how things can be done. And by the way, those of you who are graduating and going on to medical school, I am not advocating skipping your lectures, okay? What I'm advocating is learning how you learn. And we all learn in a different way. And if we can, and we, if we can do that, 
it will have a profound effect on how effective we are. The other thing about persistence and clinging to your belief is a story I want to end with because this is the year 2012, 200 years since the start of the War of 1812. And as you know, during the War of 1812, the British had decided that these young whippersnappers in America were not worthy of independence and that they should once again become a British colony. And they were winning that battle as they marched up the eastern seaboard, conquering and destroying city after city, destroying Washington, D.C., burning down the White House. The next stop, the last bastion of defense, Fort McHenry, Baltimore Harbor. And as that armada of British battleships rolled into the Chesapeake Bay, gunships as far as the eye could see, it was indeed a bleak day. General Armistead, the commanding general of Fort McHenry, had had a large American flag commission to fly over the fort, which incensed the British admiral. He said, that's offensive to us. Take that flag down. Well, we will begin the bombardment of your fort, and we will continue that bombardment until that flag is reduced. It will become a pile of rubble. Aboard that ship was a young amateur American poet by the name of Francis Scott Key. And he had overheard the British plans. He was on board on a mission from President Madison to try to gain the release of an American physician who was being held captive. They were not going to let him off the ship since he had overheard the plans. And he knew that that evening the bombardment would start. And he mourned as he thought about his fledgling young nation about to become a colony once again. And that bombardment started as the sun went down. Bombs and missiles bursting in air. It looked like the 4th of July celebration. There was so much dust and debris. He strained his eyes to try to catch a glimpse of the fort to see if the flag was still flying. Could see nothing all night long. It continued at the crack of dawn. First thing, he was out at the railing looking trying to see through the debris, but it was too thick. And as he hung his head, there was a clearing in the debris. And he saw the most beautiful sight he had ever seen. The stars and the stripes still waving. And you know, that was the beginning, many historians say, of the turning of the tide of the War of 1812. And we went on to win that war and to defend the principles of freedom that we believe in. And if you had gone into the grounds of Fort McHenry that day, you would have seen on the ground the bodies of numerous American soldiers who took turns holding up that flag. They would not let that flag down. The epitome of persistence, which is what we must believe. And that will lead us to success. And what is true success? In 1997, I was asked to come to South Africa to head up a team in an attempt to separate type 2 vertical craniopagus twins, Siamese twins joined at the top of the head facing in opposite directions. I knew it was going to be a great challenge. There had been 13 attempts to separate such twins before, none of which had been successful. But it was also going to be a great social challenge because it was going to be done at the Medical University of South Africa at Medinsa the only major black teaching hospital in South Africa, always the stepchild throughout apartheid and in the post-apartheid period. This was going to be their chance to stand shoulder to shoulder with Cape Town, Johannesburg, and all the other great universities. And I wasn't ready for all that social pressure. And I prayed for wisdom. And I, and I looked at all the information we had, the angiograms, the MRIs, the CAT scans. I used our 3D workbench put all that together into a three-dimensional image, put on the goggles, studied the vascular system, rec recognized that the common drainage system was narrower centrally than it was peripherally. And the traditional neurosurgical literature said in a, such a situation, you should decide which twin to give the drainage system to and divide them over the course of three or four operations separated in time by weeks or months so that they could develop collateral circulation. But I felt impressed 
that if we concentrated on the area where things were narrowing down, that they would develop collaterals immediately, and we could do it all in one operation. And when I explained that to the team, they said, you're the boss, we'll do whatever you want. And I remember going to that operating room two days before New Year's of 98, big sign over the OR that said, God bless Joseph and Luca Banda. And I was thrilled. I said, bring in a stereo system so we can play inspirational music. 19 hours into that operation, we were only three quarters of the way finished. The part that remained was so complex. The blood vessels were engorged. They were adhesed. They were entangled. It looked impossible. We stopped the operation. And we talked about it. And I suggested maybe we could cover that area over with skin. And we could come back in several months and they would have developed enough collateral that we could then cut through that area. And the doctors from South Africa and from Zambia said that's a great idea. But we don't have the ability to keep partially separated twins alive. They'll die. And now I really felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. I went back in there. I didn't have all my fancy equipment that I have at Hopkins. I had my scalpel, my loops, a prayer on my lips. I went in there, I started cutting between those vessels that were so thin, you could see the anesthetic bubbles coursing through, just daring you to make a nick in them. Make a long story short, when I made the last cut that separated those twins over the stereo system came the hallelujah chorus. Everybody had goosebumps, and when we finished that operation after 28 hours, one of the twins popped his eyes open reached up for the endotracheal tube. When we got to the ICU, the other one did the same thing. Within two days, they were extubated. Within three days, they were eating. Within two weeks, they were crawling. And this month, they will be graduating from the ninth grade. But that, that, thank you. But that was not, that was not the success. The success you had to be there to witness was the reaction of the people. This was done in their country, in their hospital. They were literally dancing in the street. Their level of self-esteem was so high. And that's what true success is all about. It is using the talent that you have to elevate other people. Thank you. Congratulations. Godspeed. Anyway, there's uh, not... Uh much to add. I, I am a, uh, I don't hold a candle to him in public speaking, but <laughs> that's okay. He's a natural. He is. Um, any uh, comments or questions? Well, the point's already been made, but I just find it interesting that they would choose to make that particular ideological difference and issue. I mean, what if he was, you know, I guess, you know, if he was gay or something, it wouldn't have made that an issue, but why pick, pick out that uh, particular point? Uh, of course, it was in their the biology department, so they had a vested interest, I guess. But is it, is it now a, an issue that we can only hear from people that we agree with? So, uh, On certain issues. Yeah. On other issues, there's a certain amount of latitude, but that's, that's a non-negotiable. Uh, two points. Number one, on several occasions during the various exchanges of, of the writings, it occurred to me that we're dealing essentially with what amounts to as a thought police. They're not satisfied with what you say or don't say. They don't like what you think. And if that's the case, we are already in the dark ages. We don't have to look back for them or look forward to some distant future. We're already in it. And the irony is that this is what's, uh, how should I say, promulgated by the very forces which, with the other side of the mouth, clamor for academic freedom, all in the same breath. That's one point. <laughs> point number two. I noticed the banners in the background of the stage. 
Emory University's various schools, the School of Medicine, the School of this, the School of that, and then the School of Theology. And I ask myself a very curious question. Where were the faculty from the School of Theology when this proverbial poop hit the fan? And how come none of them had anything to say on the matter? Or do they really believe that God is a fiction? In which case, what purpose does that school serve? How is that possible even? I mean, we're talking about so many inherent contradictions here, such strange paradoxes, that it seems to me that these <laughs> high and mighty, highly educated, seem to be downright stupid. Pardon the expression, but this is the case. How is it that people with all the degrees can't see past their own biases and blinders? Thank you. Um, before we go on, I will point out that it's just a little after 12, uh, 11.30, and I know some of you uh, have other places to go. but. Uh, when I was in college in the 60s during the racial incidents, I had an African roommate, the first exchange student the Adventist church had ever accepted. A lot of government behind it in college. Because I had a black roommate, on a couple of occasions, black girls invited me out on a date. I was called on the carpet for dating black girls told that God was against it. There was a doctor, Jonathan Butler, who was there at the time, had two PhDs, a wise man, in my room said that he came there from Loma Linda University. Loma Linda Academy would not allow his daughter to enter their school because she was black. You want to know how intelligent people make these decisions? I haven't a clue, but we're guilty of it. It's a prejudice. Some people have more than others. But we went through quite an experience in the two years. I had that fellow as a roommate. We forced the college to change their interracial dating policy. I was also, pardon the term, <laughs> blacklisted, not recommended for a job and graduation, and had to take another route to enter the ministry. But I could not, well, I myself, I suppose, was prejudiced before I had that experience and, and learned what the people were like and what not. But I have a very low opinion of mankind in general because of our various prejudices and stupidities. I think only a, a heart converted and changed by the gospel will make a difference in any of us. Otherwise, our history as men, as humankind, is despicable. And of course, history records the despicable more than the good. But I wonder, even today, how we will measure up to the requirements of God for inhabitants of heaven. I would say there's a couple of things that, that can be learned. Number one is, be awfully careful of what you say anywhere because Nowadays, there is nothing private. There is nothing that can't be cross-linked. And uh, uh, I will tend to just be extra careful if somebody says something that could lead one to uh, make a uh, really strong uh, position that's emotionally satisfying. but really isn't intellectually quite true, uh, to stop and be careful and say, well, you might want to 
take this the whole way, but you probably shouldn't. Um, I don't know uh, whether th the uh, interview is edited enough to omit this, but it would it would have been nice if the interview that was published had said that doesn't mean that all atheists are um, immoral, unethical. unethical. Uh, that some of them have leftover ethics from elsewhere, and some of them have the uh, innate human ethics which uh, is inborn in us and it's hard to d get rid of. Um, uh, and something like that would have gone a long way, so I think, towards pulling the teeth of the accusations that were made. Um, on the other hand, I do think that the people who made the accusations were not really being fair uh, to Ben Carson. None of them apparently contacted him. None, none of them said anything. Like, Did you really mean this? And I'm sure he would have been happy to make the clarification. Um, uh, I find it also fascinating that they're happy to have him there. They just want to call attention to their cause. Um, I think that uh, after listening to him and reading along with everybody else the article in the review, uh, I think that there was quite a bit of editorial license that went into the review article to say what the church wanted to have said. And I think that's unfortunate. In which case, uh uh, perhaps uh, the fault doesn't lie with uh, Ben Carson himself in that, in that regard, but might uh, fall uh, with our church paper, which is perhaps more eager than it should be to have things said that are politically correct, if I can put it that way, in our setting, and, uh, but which are damaging if other people are listening in. And I think this is one of the le one of the lessons that I mean it it doesn't necessarily point to a particular person because I don't know who edited or what the original interview was. Um, but I do know that our decision making capabilities are such that we can wind up publishing stuff that turns out to be kind of fluff pieces, and I think that's not a good thing in the long run. Um, and however it's happening, I think it needs to, or it is highly advisable that it changes. I, I will say one other thing, though. I, nothing demonstrates the, uh, the ability to uh, be unethical as to uh, accuse somebody of something that they don't believe without checking with them without, uh, uh, and, and trying to make a big stink about it. Right. <laughs> um, it's, it's a little bit like uh, trying to claim that you're the party of love and if you don't believe that, I'll kill you. <laughs> something is wrong there. Uh, creationists uh, tend to, uh, some of them tend to say, you know, well, uh, without uh, guidance from uh, God, an ethical code from God and so on, uh, things tend to fall apart. And they uh, frequently mention Hitler and uh, Stalin and uh, uh, where... Yeah, Pol Pot and so on as examples, which may be the case. I am um, uncomfortable with that to a certain extent, uh, mainly because uh, I think, as Ben Carson mentioned during his uh, graduation presentation there, is uh, that uh, uh, evolutionists it's wrong to say that evolutionists are not ethical uh, because, you know, a lot of them are. Uh, 
I don't know of any good study that establishes there. Now, I think there's a good point that was made in the, the discussion here that uh, uh, the basis for ethics is very uh, nebulous. Uh, uh, in fact, it doesn't exist almost in, in the evolutionary uh, model, per se, compared to the uh, one where you have divine statements that establish it. Uh, and it's a lot more flexible there, per se. But, you know, in the Old Testament, you've got wars that uh, you sit and wonder about, uh, very much so, and, uh, and uh, crusades and so on, and other things, and Christians warring with themselves and different groups. Uh, I don't think we have a clear statement there. I think we ought to be cautious. In, uh, in stating that uh, evolutionists are not ethical or that uh, uh, there is no basis for ethics and so on. Uh, uh, the basis is very weak, I'd say. But uh, I think we ought to, we ought to uh, look at the beams in our own eyes uh, before checking out the moats and others. Uh, at least uh, be understanding here. Uh, there are, there are uh, very ethical uh, people who believe in evolution. I wonder if you can explain um, sort of a dichotomy that I haven't been able to answer myself. You know, when I grew up um, thinking about the evolutionary theory or, or learning about it, it's clear that it says the survival of the fittest. And it's a pretty pragmatic, you know, that I think is still accepted today. And yet, I would say over the last decade, there's been more and more articles about the uh, moral gene, or the, uh, and that they s suggest that the moral gene or this moral thing goes back or our society couldn't exist. So, so it, it goes back fairly far. I, I, I don't understand how they resolve this dichotomy. Uh, um, and yet, if you look at, well, at the few articles I've seen about the moral gene, it would s suggest that this, this is a relatively recent evolution, and yet, the need for society goes back fairly far. Um, can you sort of tell me, um, since we're talking about ethics and some of these other kind of things, is there a good source to read about this, or is there, um, or is this just something we have to live with? Well, the, uh, the whole idea of social biology, I think, was an attempt to explain how insects, in particular, who don't have the mental capacities to think in terms of concepts, at least as far as we know, um, how ants and, uh, and bees and other highly cooperative societies can be made to work from an evolutionary perspective because the natural assumption would be that, you know, everybody go out for himself or herself as the case may be and that uh, the societies would not develop uh, what are otherwise known as heroic measures. Uh, perhaps the best known of those is the bee sting, where a, a uh, female bee will sting, and in order to make the sting more lasting and, and damaging, will leave the stinger in the victim to continue to pump poison in after the bee goes away and winds up dying because of the loss of that organ. So it is quite literally, I mean, a suicidal attack. Uh, you know, one can understand a society where people carry out suicidal attacks in humans because they're told that there's some reward or some cultural in reinforcement or something of that nature. But it's a little bit harder to understand how that works um, with creatures that don't think. And that's why sociobiology got its existence. Uh, it was founded by E.O. Wilson, whose specialty is ants. Um, he has since, I think, abandoned that to some extent. Uh, saying he, it no he, longer fits. Well, uh, he, he had a system whereby he thought, uh, you know, kin selection, and he adopted kin selection for about 40 years as the answer 
you tend to, um, you're good because uh, your genes are passed on to your next of kin, even if you sacrifice yourself uh, and so on. Uh, yeah, about, f I don't know, three or four years ago, he abandoned that idea and went more towards a random uh, source for altruism. Uh, Which is basically saying he doesn't, have an, he doesn't have a good answer at this point. Right, right. So if the best of them can't explain it, I'm not sure that I can really help you that much. Uh, it doesn't make good evolutionary sense. Now, if I was to try to explain it, my, my answer would be that God put in certain instincts into all of us that uh, are natural, if you want to put it that way, and that it takes time and randomness, random errors to efface those relationships, and yeah. that just simply hasn't had time to happen in ants um, and bees yet. And still in humans, uh, there, is, there is something that draws us powerfully to each other in ways mm -hmm. that can cause us to want uh, to do what a uh, recent gaming expert did is uh, computer games. And one of the things that he did was, uh, and I'm forget, I, Rice, I think was his name, but he was, uh, he was his computer games involved uh, heroics in battle. And mm -hmm. one day, a car headed toward him across the freeway lanes apparently had been corrected and uh, recorrected and then finally barreled into his direction. Uh, and his wife and I'm not sure what this, I think it's an unborn daughter, an unborn kid, um, were in the car in the right seat. And the first thing that he did was to swerve his car t so that when the impact came, it came completely on him and he was killed and his wife had a few minor injuries and that was it. Um, you know, I don't know whether he believed that we were all the results of chance or not. Um, Paul? But there is, there is in humans, in addition to our bad instincts, there are good instincts that God put there. And they're not totally effaced, even in atheists. And I think we need to be really careful never to say that they are. And Ben Carson, to his credit, was willing to stand up and say that quite loudly, I thought. There's an ongoing battle, which I'm not very familiar with, in the um, psychology, neurology group about this issue to a certain extent. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a severe dichotomy. Some claiming that no, that there are uh, certain genes, you know, they come up at times in the term of the God gene and th this type of thing uh, that uh, makes you religious and, and this type of thing. And those who say, look, you haven't found those genes. And s human behavior is much more complex. Don't, don't come up with such simple answers. I, I think the um, I think the B. Well, uh, I think I still think it's it's a heroic uh, insect, but and very beneficial in many ways, obviously. But um, I think the stinger in the B it has a barb on it. You really can't take it out once it's stung. But um, it, you know, not probably doesn't realize that's going to happen. But in its defense, and and what you're stating is accurate, I think anyway, because. Uh, if there's any kind of attack to the hive, the, um, the bees do go out, and obviously they know that there's a risk that they could be killed. Um, is if wasps, say, attack the nest or different kinds of bees, they're going to uh, uh, do their best to defend the, the hive. And obviously there's no um, uh, draft or something like that. You know, this is just volunteer 
but I, I the Bible does say though that for for us anyway I, I believe that it says that the uh, we're all given a, a measure of of love and measure of goodness we're um, but but really I think the we don't really match up to the uh, again I think when people say uh, as a put down for people uh, you're just an animal or something it's actually just the opposite uh, animals are actually show more uh, caring and more things it, they did a study on I don't know if you heard about this and they had rats um, where they they had a, uh, a rat could help another rat eat but it would have to suffer an electrical shock and in spite of that the the rat showed to help the other rat eat even though it got no reward at all so um, even if you're called a rat you're still better than a lot of humans I think so it's kind of interesting what I find interesting with this kind of fiasco is that the evolutionary group must feel really threatened when they feel, how should I say, afraid of somebody renowned who doesn't come from their ranks. Now, why would somebody feel that threatened that they would even risk launching a brouhaha of this sort with potential fallback on them for doing so. That can only mean one thing. Their foundation is very weak. Those who are confident in what they're talking about and know where they stand do not immediately fire rocket launchers on everybody who sees things differently. It is those who are scared that maybe their house of cards is in danger or maybe teetering or something like this. And this reminds me actually of another article I read recently of an evolutionist, believe it or not, who was invited to speak at an Ida university. And he chose, how should I say, made the poor choice of using the word design in the title of his speech. And he was an evolutionist. And there were all these protesters and hecklers that started heckling him the moment he stood up. It'd be interesting to look at that uh, particular episode. I can send you the, in, the uh, information. Uh, it is the strangest thing. And he is an evolutionist, then wrote another article. What is it about evolutionists that they're so afraid of the word design? <laughs> and the final sentence in, his, in that article was, if the evolutionists are absolutely blocking all considerations of design, no wonder that the conflict between evolutionists and creationists cannot end. And that's an evolutionist speaking. I mean, this kind of... Um, mental straitjacketing that is endeavored in order to save a mode of thinking can only be evidence of the failure of that mode of thinking. Only if a mode is weak does it need that much propping up. Did, did Ben Carson actually accuse any evolutionists of being unethical? Well, you saw not, not that I know no, it, of, and he certainly... Well, well it, it appears to me he just said that if there wasn't a God, there's no basis for 
to be ethical. That's, uh, I think and that's so a fair statement. He never really accused anybody of being unethical. It's just that they came back and said, logically, we don't believe in God, there's no God, therefore we are not ethical. So they actually turned it around on themselves. They did, they did. And, which is pretty interesting. And that's why he says, I never accused anybody of being unethical, any evolutionist. But um, another thing I was really impressed at, he, he is very smart and he is a very good speaker, but he's very, very, what's the word? <laughs> um, I'm having a lapse here. But he's brave. He, he showed some bravery. Because how in the world, courage, yeah. He just, he walked out there. He's been accused of all this stuff. And then, and then be able to still say, he, he used the word prayer two times. And um, I think maybe three, actually. Well, I counted but, two. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, I think if I would have went out there, I wouldn't have said prayer at all. I would have probably went, you know, kind of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of roundabout. But he said it twice, and that was the right thing to do. And and um, man, that's just this is pretty incredible. I I think that was that was the most impressive speech I've ever seen him heard him give because uh, there's three three qualities there in that that speech, it was just a, tremendous. And uh, I, I started to stop it in the middle and I thought, you know what, he speaks better than I do anyway, so let, let him go. Uh, yes, we have a question way in the back and then uh, Ariel both. Well, Ariel, why don't you just speak while he's getting the mic? Oh, I don't have anything to say. Okay. I, I, I just simply <laughs> take the second to say, you know, that, that I find that statement that evolution is the basis of all our information in science, you know, in the rebuttal, uh, th I find that that, that is really f a false statement. It's like the hijacking of science. Uh, it's, oh, yeah. It's, it's I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, I'm going to, after this comment, I'm going to make a comment on that myself because I, I think that gets to the nuts of why these people went nuts. Uh, a couple things. Uh, is Ben Carson basically saying that um, evolution isn't ethical, but evolutionists are ethical? Is he making a distinction? He's saying that evolution leaves you with no firm basis for an ethics. I think that's a fair way of putting what he said. Um, the, the second thing is uh, any comments about, it seems to me as though Ben Carson um, chose a sort of a very minimalist response. Uh, he did give an explanation, but it was just, you know, a couple sentences, something like that. Um, uh, whereas it may have been tempting to take the opportunity for more, sort of a more in-depth explanation, but he seemed to just sort of, and he ended up saying, you know, well, enough on that topic, and then <laughs> just, it's an interesting, interesting approach. It, it is. I think Ben Carson did exactly the correct thing. First of all, he didn't want to divert the attention of the whole occasion to the controversy. So he responded to the controversy in the minimal best way. But then he addressed the underlying issues that underpinned that controversy throughout his speech. And what are the issues? The issues are the freedom of thought, the freedom of conscience, and the freedom of what we are allowed to pursue as worthy goals in life. And he used himself as the example and his own life as the example. And he finally finished with the story of the flag still standing while under assault of the entire armada. That is picturesque. 
And if these, um, how should I say, attackers uh, were as smart as they believe themselves to be, they would see the message loud and clear. And those who were not interested in the controversy would see the message loud and clear for their own benefit. It is a wonderful message no matter which side you're looking from. In other words, Dr. Carson is a bright cookie and adapted the message so that it worked on several levels simultaneously and quite optimally. Thank you. My, my observation would be this. One of the points that is commonly made is the one that's brought up, and that is that without evolution you don't have science. Okay. Now, that's instinctively there's something wrong with that. To my knowledge, Isaac Newton was not an evolutionist. In fact, he quite firmly believed otherwise. He arguably brought in the major era of science. Um, I went through medical school. I did quite reasonably well in basic sciences. Evolution was not a major underpinning of that. The claim that evolution is the foundation of medical science, I can say from personal experience, is just bogus. Now, there may be some areas where evolution might influence a little bit. Um, Antibiotic resistance is, in, is uh, arguably uh, done from artificial selection that's unintentional and therefore starts to mimic natural selection. Uh, and the final solution, of course, is to remove the artificial selection as much as possible uh, and then allow natural selection to put things back where they were and then you don't have as many problems. But that's kind of tangential. It certainly doesn't speak to how you form new bacteria, let alone how you form, uh, uh, let's say, cats or, or humans for that matter. You don't need evolution for medicine. You really don't. The fact that these people cl loudly claim that you do Get, uh, underlies their anxiety because they know that really that's not demonstrable. I won't say that they know it's not true. That's more, that's more than, than I can really say for sure. But what I can say that is that it does, that it does show that it's not demonstrable and they know it. And this is the terrifying thing about Ben Carson, is that he comes in, he's obviously a world-renowned neurosurgeon. He obviously knows how medicine works, and he could give people the impression that medicine doesn't require evolution to work. That's right. Well, maybe that's because it doesn't. And I think that this punctures the echo chamber that they've been putting up that says everything that nothing in biology makes sense ex except as it relates to evolution. A famous quote by Dobhansky. Uh, and, uh, pardon me, <laughs> sorry for the, the mispronunciation. Uh, but uh, his, you know, it's, this is this is what they are told. So that you know, every time you say science, it funnels into evolution. Uh, and uh, if we got men on the moon, then they got there by way of the amoeba, and uh, by way of the lizard on the, on the way through. You know, that's how it has to be. 
because otherwise evolution is kind of a shaky proposition. Okay. And I, I, this is, you see, they have to claim science for themselves. Here is a world-renowned scientist who doesn't agree with them. It threatens their very existence. And I think that's why they went off. But, but I, think, uh, I think what's going on here is, is broader than just uh, defending a theory that, that they hold to be true. We, we don't see this uh, dynamic occurring in other fields of science in which there's dispute. Um, I, I think, I, and you know, if, if, you, if you took uh, these people and, and said, okay, you have a um, thousand, you know, I don't know, ten thousand dollars that uh, you have to bet, you know, in favor of evolution or, or against evolution, and you have, to, you have to bet, you know, this is the rules of the game, and you put your money down, they would probably put down evolution. They probably have more confidence in evolution than they have doubts about evolution. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure I'd agree that they sort of deep down inside seriously question it, you know, as to, they, they probably, you know, 50-50, they probably err on the side, they probably say, no, I actually do believe in evolution. Um, I think the issue is they recognize, and I think most, most everybody recognizes, the, the uh, stakes. Uh, that's, that's why this whole issue of creation evolution is, is so important and so defended and fought and people get upset and all these sorts of dynamics well beyond simply a, a discussion of some, you know, I don't know, some point that doesn't, in the final analysis, doesn't really matter. Uh, people understand, I think, that if there is no God, this makes a huge difference in terms of their own ethics, you know, who's in charge, who can choose, what sort of lifestyle that they get to live, all, all sorts of issues which we hold, we all hold very, you know, important. Uh, I think you're right on that. Uh, the, this uh, overstatement by Doug, by Doug Jansky, uh, that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Uh, you'd have to say, well, all the science that was done before the acceptance of evolution, and we were talking about, you know, Harvey, the circulation and the, the blood and uh, a lot of uh, cosmology and so on, it makes sense. Uh, th this is a very over, this is a superficial overstatement to, to, to state that. Uh, historically, it, it, it doesn't hold up. But it's a comforting if you're in the, on that side. And I, I think that's the thing. What's happening is that the, the mere existence of Ben Carson is pushing people outside of their comfort level. They have always been able to tell themselves and be told by everybody else around them well, at least everybody else that's important, you know, forget the rubes and all that, but, but the, the, the really important people, they are told by them that, you know, if you're going to be a good doctor, you just have to believe in evolution. And here comes a good doctor, and he doesn't believe. Um, and rather than allowing his testimony to stand there, and, you know, well, he's won, but they're 99 against him, big deal, you know, um, uh, they are they dead set that there must be 100%. And, and that, in and of itself, I think is an, an interesting requirement. That, that, that is, it, it's, um, it's a testimony to intolerance. Because if you have such a requirement that you cannot possibly tolerate any dissension, what does that say about your position? I mean, even God doesn't have that kind of intolerance. I mean, if it, he did, then Lucifer could never have rebelled. And most of us wouldn't be here either. Uh, you, that's it. You see, I mean, this is, this is the most remarkable thing. This is, this is stunning in a sense. But whenever you see intolerance rear its head, it is always over some kind of position or thinking that someone else has that contradicts the thinking that I have. Yeah. I have one more comment and then I think we'll quit here. I 
was just going to say that I think this was a mini great controversy. And it shows that everybody has to decide what side they're going to be on. Yeah. And I found it very interesting to watch how each side positioned themselves. I, I think it's also important uh, to remember not only which side we're on, but also how we conduct ourselves when we're on that side. Uh, ben Carson, I think, did himself and his cause a huge uh, favor by reacting minimally, graciously, and uh, simply being who he was. It seems it was an example of, you don't know who was in that audience, you don't know what people think, and you don't know how God will use that in the future. Yeah. And I thought it was well done and well said, and highlighted that everybody has to choose which side they're going to be on, but that our God is a gracious God and he brings us all along and we should be thankful.